This video is supported by EmuDB, the lightweight, high-speed immutable database for systems and applications. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. A lot of people write to me about some questions they have about the JCL statements in general and particularly about the DD statement, the data definition statement in JCL. I don't think there is, you can think of any JCL, useful JCL script that will not include at least one data definition statement. And so I get lots of questions by, by mail and, and, and uh, by chat from people who are new to the mainframe and they've seen maybe some of the videos here and they've been reading about uh, the mainframe, especially with the New Jersey Health Department scandal about uh, people not being able to update the mainframe software fast enough because they couldn't find people and then they blamed the mainframe instead of blaming their HR department. But anyway, uh, people have been recently going in, uh, in bigger numbers back to the mainframe. And when you start playing with the mainframe with MBS, uh, or any of the following uh, versions of MVS, such as uh, OS 390 or ZOS, you will inevitably will have to learn JCL. If you're new to MVS and to the IBM mainframe, there is no way around learning the job control language that comes with the with the MVS operating system. As we know, JCL is indispensable because it is the way to launch and submit jobs to the operating system. Uh, we know that MVS and uh, to this day, ZOS are primarily batch operating systems. Yes, you can do online work, which is what we're doing here right now in TSO or with Kix and other means, but it is to its core, the mainframe is there because it shines at one thing, and that is processing millions or billions of records efficiently, reliably, with a very high availability and with high security. And so when you're processing records in very large numbers, you're talking almost by definition batch. Yes, you can do online uh, transaction processing with kicks and other means, but eventually it all goes into data that needs to one point or another be processed in batch. What I'm talking about here, let's imagine a credit card company once a month uh, or, or more regularly invoices need to be produced and an invoice uh, job to produce, to make the invoices and send them to people so they pay the credit cards hopefully will have to be done in batch you're not going to do this in, uh, in an online fashion because you're not going to do one or one invoice at a time when you're a company like Citibank or I don't know Visa and you have 500 million customers you have to produce them in batch because that's efficient way to do it and that's where mainframes are really good at so to launch any batch job for execution on a mainframe you will have on an IBM mainframe you will have to learn JCL. JCL is what schedules jobs to be executed on a mainframe. As we all know, and we've discussed this in this channel many dozens of times already, there needs to be a job card, which is the first card that tells something to the operating system about who is scheduling a job, what you want it to be called, where it's going to be executed, what is going to happen to the output, and, uh, and some other housekeeping information. We also already looked a little bit at the data definition statement in a previous video I made, uh, video M114, where we spoke specifically about the data set name statement in JCL, as well as the disposition statement. Disposition says, informs the operating system of, about what is the nature of this file, what do we want to have exclusive right to it, is it ready? there do we need to append to it do we need to create it new do i want to have we want to share it with other jobs you're reading and writing to this to this uh, uh data set and so there is already a video that i made about the disposition statement in m114 today we're going to be focusing on the more difficult parts of the dd statement such as the space statement where a lot of people come back to me with questions, especially beginners, and there's nothing wrong with, uh, about being a beginner, uh, and the unit statement, as well as the volume statement. And there's a few other little statements here and there, 
but uh, these are statements that anybody who is working with the mainframe, every beginner needs to understand thoroughly because otherwise you'll keep um, stumbling on on uh, on JCL job um, scripts that that don't work for you, and then if you cannot make it work, you'll be it's going to be a frustrating experience. So today we're going to look at the DD statement exclusively. And by the way, if you're not a beginner, I'm sure that here and there you'll find some things about the D statement you did not know before. So I'm sure there's going to be a few interesting surprises here and there. If you, even if you're not a beginner and you feel confident about JCL, the people never stop learning about JCL. I keep learning about JCL, JCL still fairly regularly, and um, and so you want to buy a book, you want to study the subject. But I also know that in this day and age, we're now in the middle of 2020, a lot of people don't have the patience anymore to read documentation or to read books. So this is what my channel is here for. Let's look a little bit at the statement. I made some slides here where we go into the data definition statement. So DD stands for data definition. Now. Uh, the general syntax of any DD statement, as you've seen on the mainframe that I'm connected to here, is always starts with the DD. And as you can see here, the highlighting of the ISPF editor recognizes this as a keyword. So this is a keyword, it needs to be in the line immediately after the name of the of this data definition that this job will carry. So it's important to understand that the name you put in here only has a meaning within this job. It does not continue to identify the data set after this job has finished executing, either to completion, successful completion, or by mistake. The real data set name is, here, is this, but the symbolic name within the script is gonna be this one. So I could call it anything, I could call it uh, mouse, oops, I think it has to be uppercase, Mickey, and then I can call it here sys1.logrec. So this is the symbolic name within the script, and this is the physical data set name on the platter, on the, on the disk device, on the DASD. So uh, it is important to keep these two things apart. I, I still get regularly questions, I want to say almost once a week, what's the difference between this and this? It's a fair question. It's a good question. I mean, if you're coming for the first time to the operating system, what is the difference between this name here, Mickey, and syslogrec? This is the name on the disk itself. And this is the symbolical name, which only has a meaning during the execution of this job. One more thing I wanted to say before we dive into my slides is that MVS and ZOS, as well as VSC, SP, don't really have a file system. A VM on the mainframe does have a file system, but VSC or DOS VSC and MVS and ZOS do not have a file system in the classic understanding and modern understanding of the word where we think that we can just create a file and the operating system knows where to put it. We need to give plenty more information about the nature of the file, or as we call a data set, to the operating system, to MVS and ZOS, to, um, so that it can be stored efficiently, and then found again uh, expediently, as well as put in the right place and handled the right way. So there is no automate. There is kind of a file system, but it's it, it's not an automated file system such as we have on Windows or Linux, uh, and in reality. What people think of a file system on the mainframe is really just a catalog. You're interacting really just with the catalog so that at least the catalog knows where to go find it on the disk. But it's really all there is to it. Uh, you will have to decide lots of parameters when it comes to data sets on MVS and ZOS. And that's where the data definition statement is for. I know that some people get frustrated by it, but on the other hand, you have way more control over the nature, the handling, the storing, and the and and, uh, and the upkeep of any data set on the mainframe. So it is an important and essential part of any work with the mainframe. So let's go to my presentation here. So the general syntax of the DD statement is you give it the symbolic name here, and then the physical data set na name, 
Then you have the disposition statement, which uh, about which I made a video. I'll get to that in a second. Then you have the record format, the um, the record length, as well as the space definition into which we're going to get in a second. So data set defines uh, resources required by job step uh, with information about the organization, how, what is the structure inside the data set, storage requirements, record format, and much more. So that's what goes into it. The disposition parameter, as we just saw before, is the parameter that tells the operating system what is the sharing and the creation and duration of the data set. I made a whole video about that. It's called um, MBS and ZOSD Parameters Made Easy M114. So if you want to know more about this position parameter special, uh, because even that is just a science on its own, go find this video. Let's start with the unit parameter. The unit parameter speaks about the device. When we say unit, it's a device. And in, uh, in the MVS days, the 370 or 24-bit days, devices had a three hexadecimal unit number. Later on, that was, that was not enough because there were data centers with more than FFF uh, devices, uh, typically uh, screens and disk devices were the ones that took a lot of the namespace. And so IBM created four digits, the hexadecimal, within limitations, not all hexadecimal combinations are really possible, but um, four, four digit hexadecimal uh, names for units. And then we have group names and we have device names such as uh, disks or DASD or tape. They can be called also symbolically. So this is the unit name. It has a unit count uh, parameter as well as deferment and some other uh, little, well, uh, less understood um, parameter names as well. The syntax again is as an example. Here we assign, we have a data definition for this data set, moshex.stuff. We call it data one. This position. Uh, we're going to get into it, which is create and keep. And then the volume serial is backup. So this is, it's going to be stored in the catalog with the with the uh, volume serial backup. And there can only be one volume called backup in the whole mainframe here. And the unit is going to be 3520. So what this does, if there was a volume called, if it was a, a tape dev a device called 3520, it was a, it would, this would assign this device 3520 to this data set and no other. It cannot go on a 3480, it cannot go on a 3590. Um, um, it cannot go on anything other than this device here, if there was a device like that. Another example here is the um, this one, where we have data is the symbolic name. Moshik stuff is the physical name. And then here we say unit, we skip to the unit name, so it can go anywhere, but it assigns three devices to this data set. So it can use up to three devices. So th as you can see, th it's important if you want to process very large data sets efficiently. And that's, in, in fact, as I said in the beginning, that's what the mainframe is for. You need to be able to um, deal with many devices. You need to be able to uh, tell the day operating system how you want those devices to be used. In, 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 in uh, one after the other, up to how many, et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of control is required on the mainframe because the mainframe is there to process large number of the huge numbers of, uh, of records. The unit parameter, here for instance, we say unit tape.3, which means we allocate three tapes. If you don't say anything, if you leave the comma.3 out, it means you allocate one unit to it. Um, here's another example of what we can do, Unis, unit tape, uh, comma P. The P means it allocates as many volumes as needed. So let's just say allocate as many volumes as needed. And in the, if it's a tape, a volume, of course, would be a tape reel, right? It's very important to understand what is the media. When it's tape, it's a reel. So what, what we want to do here, maybe it's a backup. I'm going to say allocate as many backup tape medias as required and let's say that you have a backup job that has that you know is going to be using lots and lots of media on tape medias or reels 
then you want to say here defer because otherwise when the job starts all those need to be uh, to, to be mounted if you say defer they will be only mounted when one reel finishes the next one is going to be uh, it's going to pop up on the operator console and the operator tape operator will go and find the tape that it that it tells it to go find usually maybe a scratch tape and mount it on the device that it's that the operator is told to mount later on as we know all this was automated by tape robots and i remember using some of those but still uh, you if you only have one tape robot with maybe three or four tape devices in it the defer statement is key so that other jobs can continue to process in parallel so defer means ask the operator to mount only when accessed don't ask it that because otherwise if you don't if you don't put the defer in it's going to ask the operator to mount it at the beginning of the job what if the job takes five hours right so remember that the mainframe is there to process huge amounts of records and which sometimes can take hours affinity equals dd1 so here we say the affinity with another job step unit so that it is always mounted on the same device so in 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 big data centers you will have many tape devices and the operating system will try to round robin a little bit based on allocation patterns based on the scheduling based on the information it has from all the jobs running on the mainframe uh, and so you may switch around quite a bit if you want it to be uh, if you have multiple steps in your job and you say i process one tape in in step one that tape now is going to be processed in tape two then the 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 sensible thing to do would be to say affinity so that the operator doesn't have to run around between tape devices and take it from one place put it in another place because the same tape is going to be processed again so this is the affinity now in previous operating systems before mvs and i've i've had videos about the history of mvs a plenty so um there we all know by now if you've been watching some of the videos on this channel that before mvs we had things like MVT and there was a separate parallel line called VS1 and before it was called PMFT. So those earlier operating systems from the very, um, from mid 60s to the very early 70s, they had also this parameter SEP, uh, which, and why is that? Because those mainframes uh, in those days had, had slow channels. A channel on the mainframe is an IO processor. It's a computer in its own right and those computers within the mainframe were there to enable the processor on the mainframe to only deal with calculations and processing and all the io activity will go through the channels which are io processors and so if you and of course those could saturate with traffic and so if you if you wanted to be efficient you could split up a job across two or three or four channels and each channel you had to purchase separately from ibm yeah, to this day and so um, by using the SCP the separator you can now spread out things over many channels and therefore accelerate the completion of a batch job so this is very typical of a batch job oriented parameter and the reason why it's not in MVS anymore because MVS is still of course primarily a batch oper oriented operating system but this kind of things became a little bit less important also because with MVS XA, the 31-bit release of MVS, which came out in 81 or 82, uh, IOs could start on one channel and come back from another channel. So this came kind of uh, uh, obsolete with uh, later releases of MVS. Let's go to the volume parameter. Volume parameter seems simple for most people because most people only see it as volume equals serial equals serial number, like this one. However, there's way more options in the volume serial that's why i'm saying you can always learn new things from uh, from from jcl so as an example we have here uh, dd that's a symbolic name that's just the name of the of the data set remember that up to 41 characters long including the dots that's the maximum length of any data set name 41 characters including the dots now people think that dots are there to create subdirectories. No, you can, if you want, you can think of it as subdirectory, but that's just a logical thing. There's no subdirectories at all on the MVS 
or Zeus uh, standard file system. There is, of course, a hierarchical file system within the Unix system services of ZOS, but that's a, a separate topic. Then we have here disposition, which means we are, we, are, we attach to the um, to the data set, but we keep it after the job finishes. And here we say unit 3490 volume, and here is a very complex volume definition that most people have probably never seen before. Uh, certainly not the beginners here, and uh, that's what this video is for. We request a data set here, with, with, which is on two volumes, this one and this one, and up to four volumes can be attached if needed. So this is a way to tell the operating system, I know that these two um, volumes are going to be needed, these two serial volumes, tapes, uh, this probably will be a tape, and and so at the very minimum we need this, but I can give it up to four additional ones if the job requires it. So in case these two are enough, then the operator is only going to be asked to mount this once. If up to two more are required, so two additional, then the operating system, the operator is going to be required to mount, mount two more scratch volumes. So here are some more parameters to the volume. Uh, th those will be called sub-parameters in JCL, so this is the main parameter, this is the sub-parameter. Private means don't allocate any other data sets on this volume. So this is of course only useful for tapes, not for disk. You don't want to have only one data set on a disk device, that would be disastrous use of, uh, of capital. But for tapes, sometimes, uh, let's say you want to send somebody a tape, then you don't want by any coincidence or mistake, any other data set to be on the tape that you're going to send somebody outside the data center. So private will be the one sub-parameter to make sure that nothing else goes on that tape. Uh, now, if you know that there's going to be, let's say you're doing in one job step, you're copying some data sets, and then you're going to copy some more data sets later on in a different job step, you would call code the retain sub-parameter in volume. So he wouldn't unmount and mount each time because as we saw at the introduction of, of this video for every mounting and unmounting the glass comes down for the 3420 uh, tape devices and then it goes up it's it's a process that takes about roughly a minute or maybe slightly more and so the retain make sure that the tape stays mounted the vacuum is still in the tape device and it's ready to execute the next job SCR stands for serial so either for one volume or for two, you can say here, within breaks, tape one, tape two, which tells it exactly which serial device to use. And if it's tape, of course, the, one tape will have one serial name on it, and the catalog will remember exactly which tape it is, and you cannot, um, tape are not anonymous on the mainframe. They have an identity. Now let's go to the space parameter, which is maybe the most difficult part of it all. Now the space parameter is where most people need to be very careful and learn this well, because this is where most people stumble. And that's because in the modern Unix and Windows world, people are not used to parameters with an empty comma. I think that's, personally, I think that's the main reason why people get confused because sometimes you find examples where there are empty commas and and so because those are positional parameters. Let's remember that in JCL there are name parameters, they can be anywhere, and some parameters or sub-parameters usually, they need to be in a certain order. And if they're not in that order, things are not gonna work. And usually the comma is the separator between those things that need to be in a certain place. So, um, Space parameter has, uh, let's use first an example maybe. Here's one where we say DD2, that will be of course the symbolic name. And the device is 3390, which we all know is a DASD device, a CKD device, not a fixed block. IBM also has two kind of disk devices really on the mainframe today. One is, um, FBA devices, fixed block devices, kind of similar to SCSI devices, but ZOS and MBS refuse to work with those. 
and only ZVM will work with those. And then you have the um, CKD kind of like, almost you can think of a key value store on the disk uh, devices. They're the classic th CKD 3390 devices. And, um, and so those um, devices are the ones that we primarily uh, occupied with on, on the ZOS and MBS operating system. MBS itself had some support for FBA fixed block devices like such as the 3370, but well, let's not go into there for now. So um, volume serial, this is the name of the, this is not just a number, it has, this could be alphanumeric or just numeric, it has no meaning be, beyond the alphanumeric uh, sense of it. And then here's the space. So we, we allocating cylinders obviously, it could be tracks, it could also be blocks. So it's either cylinders, tracks, or blocks. So we ask here for 10 cylinders, and you can see here, there's a coma, coma. And a lot of people write to me, is it is is this correct, coma, coma? And tell them, yes, it is, because those are positional parameters. If you don't put anything in there, you still need to put the coma, because the operating system is looking for uh, anything in there. If there is nothing, it has a meaning. So, um, we want 10 cylinders, of which 10 are directory records. So you need to tell it, unlike, and as I, when I mentioned that MVS doesn't really have a file system, that's a good example. When you create, uh, when you create uh, members or partition data sets which contain themselves several members, then you need to tell it how many directory blocks to allocate. Each one uses 256 bytes. So, and of course, there's a possibility you could run out of it. So if you do a lot of saving, each time you save a member in a, in a partition data set using a new 256 byte records. So uh, 10 is not a lot. So this would be a typical space for one thing that is written and never saved or changed again, because, um, because this would not be enough for a lot of uh, change editing and saving. So, and then we have this parameter here, which says, put it contiguously. Why is that? Back in the days, since we don't have a real operating system, that's one more end, um, that's more indicator, we don't have an operating system, because we have to tell it, we have to tell the operating system, put all this data set contiguously in one area of the disk for speed. And of course, nowadays on Windows and Linux, you have no way to tell the operating system where to put it. It just puts it wherever it decides to put it. And if after a while you have fragmentation, you need to go and defragment uh, the, uh, the device with uh, Windows or Linux. You also will have eventually um, fragmentation with um, mainframe testes or disks. So it's not like this is going to resolve it, especially because humans are deciding here where to put things. So after a while, you may want to defragment so that you have more contiguous areas because a lot of jobs still want the data sets to be allocated in a contiguous area. So defragmenting is sometimes needed. Okay, so the second example, of course, is, uh, oops, sorry about that. The second example is this one. We request one, request A, which is stupidly named. Um, we say here that we want this data set EXM on this DASTY device with this volume and this space and then DCB KeyLan 8. So a lot of people sometimes, uh, a lot of people get to me and say, well, what? What is this thing? Why do we have a DCB? This is very, very strange. And so uh, sometimes it's needed. And we, why is that? Because if we realize here we don't have cylinders or tracks. So if you don't have cylinders or tracks, it means by default you're talking about blocks. And the block length um, is uh, 1024 bytes with 75 day blocks of data expected. So here you tell it, what is, you know, how much data you're expecting this job to, uh, to write. And then each block is going to be preceded by eight, um, by eight bytes in this one. Okay. So now uh, the MBS goes and computes how many tracks are needed depending on the device 
in, in this uh, unit here. So because block uh, sizes are different or track sizes are different on every the different uh, disk device, MVS knows about the characteristics of each disk device and based on this we'll now go and calculate how many tracks. So you specify blocks here and and so you have 1024 plus 8 bytes of uh, if maybe index or some kind of uh, um, a key data and so we will out of this it will calculate how many tracks it needs to allocate on the disk at a particular disk address so let's see what the parameters are uh, and if you want to look here again you will see that um, sometimes you have jobs that say things like can we find one maybe this one sometimes you have keywords such as release and others oops that's a that's a binary no here we have a dd but no so we can't find one here but you will sometimes encounter the subparameters such as release, contiguous, mixed, and round. So release means allocated but unused space is to release when the data set closes. Sometimes you need just the data set temporarily to process a job, a batch job. And so uh, all uh, if you allocate let's say a thousand cylinders but you only use 800, it's stupid to keep those 200 around. So release means the allocated but unused space is going to be released when the close uh, macro is going to be executed. Contig means the primary. This only, and I'm writing here primary in, in uppercase because this only works for the primary space allocation, not for the secondary, where you say primary space allocation must be contiguous. MXIG means prime, prime space allocation must be the largest contiguous area in a volume. And why is that? Because sometimes you want to grow it. And so, or sometimes you want this, this data set is so performance critical, you want it to be, let's say, put towards the middle of the disk or somewhere, so, uh, so that you have less seeking. And so the MXIG, which you see less today, and why is that? Because on today's mainframes, there's really no more dedicated disk devices. All the disk devices are emulated through a SAN or a NAS. And so uh, there, each each block is going to be written randomly selected by the by the NAS or SAN anyway so this doesn't have much meaning anymore maybe even this I mean I cannot think where this would be uh, having any meaning in, meaning in a modern mainframe system round is important when you have uh, JCL which deals with blocks such as we saw here this only deals with blocks then you want to round up so that uh, it rounds up the allocation to an integer number. Now, if you specify tracks and cylinders, such as in this example, then of course the round, even if you put it there, it's going to be ignored because there's no, you are specifying how many tracks or cylinders you need. So there's no need to round. So these are some of the most important um, DD statement uh, parameters. It's important to understand all of those if you don't understand, it's going to be black signs all the time. And I see uh, and, and I get inquiries from people all the time saying, I don't understand this very, it's uh, first of all, people are not used to uppercase anymore. That confuses them. And that's OK, because this is a video for beginners. It's OK if you're confused. That's why I'm making this video. But don't be confused by the uppercase. That's just the way it is. And then you need to understand what is the meaning of each subparameter within a parameter and then it all starts to make sense. The best way, of course, as, you, as always, is to experiment and in a, an emulated mainframe, such as with MVS 3.8 as delivered by TK4, if you make a mistake, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you can always fix it and uh, or make a copy and then you know put it on disk and, and make, create a new one. So there's plenty of, uh, let's see here what we have.
maybe we'll find some other examples no so I can find right now any other examples but it's important to play with these parameters and so that you get familiar with them and it's only by making mistakes and event you know now and then deleting some data set by mistake or overriding by mistake that we learn to uh, to be careful with all those things obviously if you use um, something like this then uh, if you go to the you can look at all the data sets in a, on, a, on a volume or something like that then you can also see so the operating system as we know knows about the organization PO means partitioned organized so this is partition data set fixed block 80 block size so remember that the operating system needs to know what is the length the record length because MBS is a record oriented operating system it's not a stream op oriented operating systems or byte stream oriented operating systems such as MVS or such as Windows sorry or Linux it is record oriented and so it needs to know how long are those records are they fixed are they variable how long are they how many records in a block and people always people come to me very often and say why do I need to specify a block imagine that for you have a million records and for every record you need to go on the disk read it and process it it will be very inefficient if you don't group them together one way or another it's going to be extremely slow so what MBS does is it blocks them it groups them together in blocks so that uh, blocks should always be a multiple of the record length and by doing that there's going to be one disk operation reads it in and now the program can process it and then when it finishes processing this block of records it will ask for the next one and this way you're going to be many 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 times faster than if you were doing it one record at a time so blocking is important now the other thing about blocks is that since track sizes are different for each disk device uh, they have different length the block um, size needs to kind of take into consideration um, we want to make a block fit within a track but not more and not less so ideally a whole block would fit within a track a track is one circular motion around the disk so that all this data is going to be read in, read in and written very very efficiently so this is just um, to give you an overview and for you to start to make sense whenever you see uh, data sets oops let me see what else we have here Whenever you see um, job, job control language, you can now start to understand. So now we know, let's remove the extra information here. Now we know that this is a DD, DD statement. It starts here, all the way here with the symbolic data, uh, DD name. Then we have the data set name, the unit. Uh, this can only be a 3390. Like if you have also 3380 devices, this can never go there. And not only needs to be a 3390, it needs to be also this particular volume. So now, since we're also telling it this particular volume, in theory, we could also leave out the unit because the unit and the volume serial kind of go together. If this volume serial is in a 3390, it can be a 3380. Now, um, and so the disposition is also very important, as well as um, things like here again, the disposition, the space. One thing to understand is that every time we submit a job control language to MVS, what the um, nucleus does, what the operating system does is it forms what we call a DCB, a data control block in the operating system memory for this very particular data definition. And so this, and, and there is three places where the data control block or DCB need to be in sync. One is the catalog, which stores the information about these things. The data, the, the catalog will know what is the, what are the characteristics of any data set. Second, the application program will have to access the data set, data set with the same kind of um, parameters as the JCL. So if it's fixed block, and the and the application starts trying to read this variable block, uh, it's not gonna it's not gonna work. So 
so so the catalog and the application need to have the same kind of treatment of the device of the data set sorry and then finally the jcl is the third aspect we also needs to treat it the same way and only if the dcbs for each for all these threes are in sync and are the same you will have a happy execution of a job is if any of those has a differing or different different um, uh, description of the data set by either block length or 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 uh, size or volume or unit if all those are not perfectly in sync the job will fail and they will give you a band code telling you more or less where it thinks it found the error so this three th it's important to understand that the application software that which in this case here is, is this one this i if this is a program this has an understanding of the organization of this data set the catalog has the same and the jcl here as well and they all need to have the same description of the data set data set and for each description the operating system creates a dcb you will hear this over and over again a data control block of the definition and description of this data set so i hope that uh with with this um, presentation i made some of the concept a little bit easier to understand especially for the uh for the beginners um starting to look into mbs and again i'll say i've said it in many other places if you're a beginner don't get into zos play with mbs it's a much easier to understand much more fun operating system and easier also to back up and and you know and it's just 250 megabytes make a copy before you make any any uh, dangerous change to your uh, disk devices so that if something goes wrong you just copy uh, the old uh, backup over on the disk um, on your windows or linux machine and start it again so i would perf i would personally not advise you to start learning the mainframe with zos a lot of and, and this is my maybe the only negative comment i'm going to make here sometimes people are impatient they think that if they want to learn something they need to go to the latest latest version of 2020 no first of all the latest versions they're going to be much more res resource intensive much more difficult to learn and also potentially for most people illegal so stick with mvs learn this concept of mvs everything that you learn on mvs applies to zos so learn first on mvs and then move over uh, to zos and your in your university mainframe or at your company wherever you're working um, don't download stuff illegal uh, illegally and uh, and play with mvs tk4 if you have any questions you can always ask questions below this video in the comments if you like this particular video i would ask you to please press on the thumbs up button let's see if you can get those running again and thank you very much for watching and goodbye <music>